Thanks everyone for coming. Mm -hmm. I'm Jennifer Tuttle. I'm the faculty director of the Maine Women Writers Collection. And so on behalf of the collection, I would like to tell you how much we appreciate you coming today and to welcome you to the third annual Donna M. Loring Lecture. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Office of Multicultural Affairs and Diversity Programs, and the Women's and Gender <coughs> Studies Program. Today's talk is part of the Diversity Lecture Series, which provides opportunities to critically examine issues of diversity, equity, and justice, and to promote a more diverse and culturally pluralistic community. And I especially want to thank Kathleen Miller, the curator of the Maine Women Writers Collection, and Catherine Fisher, um, her wonderful, multi-talented assistant, um, as well as Donna Gaspar Jarvis for helping to make this event happen today. They get lots of credit for that. Now, we do understand that some of you need to leave before 1 o'clock for classes, and that is fine. So please just do so quietly um, and do uh, turn off your cell phones, please, yes, now. I'm just case do. Yeah. <laughs> Always need that reminder. Uh, and also, at any time, you may please feel free to get up and get more lunch, help yourself to cookies or whatever you want. We're, we don't stand on ceremony here. Okay. So before we begin, I just wanted to say a few words about our annual Donna M. Loring lecture. As many of you know, Donna Loring is a tribal member of the Penobscot Indian Nation, and she held the position of the nation's representative to the Maine State Legislature for 12 years. Among her many accomplishments in that capacity was her sponsorship of the act to require the teaching of Maine Native American history in Maine schools, which has already begun to, in Loring's words, help shine light, the light of knowledge on that dark place where Indian people have been hidden for almost 200 years. Donna is the author of In the Shadow of the Eagle, a tribal representative in Maine, and that was published by Tilbury House in 2008. And books will be for sale after the talk, thanks to the bookstore. And you can see John Cooper back there in the corner with those books ready for sale. And I'm sure Donna would be willing to sign one for you as well. So please don't forget about that. In early 2009, Ms. Loring deposited her personal, professional, and literary papers to the Maine Women Writers Collection here at UNE, uh, which is a special library collection of rare and unique material related to the lives and writing of Maine women. It's housed on the Portland campus uh, in the library there, but we do bring the materials down here whenever we can. Donna Loring's <coughs> papers comprise the first collection given by a Native American woman to the university, and we're deeply honored to have it. We're, we're honored for that not only because it's inherently special and valuable, but also because of all it will allow us and is allowing us to do to support research and promote scholarship on Native issues, as well as to enrich educational opportunities uh, for and about Indigenous peoples. We're profoundly grateful to Donna for honoring us in this way. The annual Donna M. Loring Lecture highlights issues of concern <laughs> to Native people in Maine and beyond, and it's one way we hope to acknowledge Ms. Loring for her generous gift. So it is now my pleasure to turn the, the podium over to Donna Loring. Thank you, and good afternoon, and uh, thanks for, uh, for coming to this. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about the lecture itself. Um, first of all, <coughs> my, my partner in life said to me, um, you mean there's a Donna M. Loring lecture series? You're not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. <laughs> That's great. No. Um, that being said, <laughs> um, um, I, th I find that the fact that this lecture is in October 
it's it's pretty symbolic, I think. You know, when you think that yesterday was uh, Columbus Day, um, and in this country, it, it creates a holiday around a man that's uh, uh, killed thousands of Native people, and we're still we're still celebrating that holiday, which I think sort of speaks a little bit about where this country is still at. And the other thing I thought was sort of uh, symbolic as well is that uh, October is also Halloween. So you put, you know, I could do a whole lecture on this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you put those two things together, you know, that this country is masking itself, you know, as a civil rights, uh, human rights country, and yet they've, uh, they've refused, well, they've sort of accepted the indigenous rights declaration, sort of, you know, with, with certain qualifications. So this lecture um, uh, is very important in it, as far as native issues, Wabanaki issues, to be brought right in the middle of all of this stuff to say, and, and then, it, then you've got the occupation of Wall Street. So, you know, hey, um, we're here, and we're gonna talk about some of our, our issues, but which th this issue today is <coughs> really important to, uh, to uh, Maine Native people, and it really goes back to, uh, to, the, to the boarding schools and the attempt to um, to make native children white in in their cultural values and uh, sort of blend all of us into the majority culture, which is in itself a form of, of genocide. So uh, this is truly uh, an important topic, and uh, I got really um, excited when I heard that this was a project happening here in Maine. Uh, Truth and Reconciliation Project. I had had heard about uh, Truth and Reconciliation Projects in the past. A friend of mine, who was the, uh, her name was uh, Sheila Sasulu, who was the uh, ambassador to South Africa, uh, had a, uh, in, you know, the experience in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation. And we talked about that. I talked about that with her, and then she, she was the consulate in New York, and then she got the ambassadorship and went to D.C. And throughout that time, I, I, I knew her and had lots of conversations with her. And there's this book that she lent me, and I haven't given it back to her yet. <laughs> uh, and the book is called The Country of My Skull. And it's about the stories, the, the cases, and the incidents that happened to um, Africans before the truth and reconciliation uh, process. But this process here in Maine um, is not exactly like the process in South Africa. It's very unique and it's very different. And I'm, lo I'm looking forward to this process. Um, one of the results is being a healing result for the, for the tribes and also for, for the state. And also to, to create um, different ways of doing things to help Native families and Native children. So that's why I think that this is a great, uh, very important topic today. So I hope, you, uh, I hope you, you listen and I hope you learn. Thank you. curator at the Maine Women Writers Collection, and I just wanted to um, thank everyone for coming. And I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. Um, but I wanted to begin with a piece that, um, a short thing about um, Wabanaki prophecy that I found, um, Denise received an award in 2001, and this was something that she referenced, and I felt it was a really good frame for um, what we're going to talk about today. 
There are seven prophecies of the Wabanaki, and we believe that we are currently in the time of the seventh fire. The first prophecy spoke of the chosen ground that is shaped like a turtle, which will begin and end our journey. The second speaks of our camps along the great waters and the loss of the sacred shell of our direction. The third marks the time when the path is found to the chosen ground where food grows upon water. The fourth fire told of the coming of the light-skinned people and what to expect. The fifth told of a time of great struggle that will grip the lives of all native people. The sixth tells of sickness and the loss of balance in our lives through the taking of our children and loss of the teachings, which would result in many losing their will to live. The seventh fire is upon us. New people will emerge to retrace the steps of our ancestors, find what was lost, and light the eternal fire of peace. We were told of a great healing that would start in the east and move to the south during the seventh fire. We would know that the time has come because the heartbeat of our mother through the drum would once again be heard. The drum was lost for many years. It was the youth who brought the drum back and the youth who continue to honor it. I just feel like this is really what is happening right now. So um, I'm really glad to have the three of you here today. <coughs> and I'll just introduce in the order next to me. Um, so in a region where people and communities have been isolated and often powerless for decades, Denise Altvader has created a supportive web of connection and communication, which she views as, an es as essential to improving Wabanaki conditions. Under her 16 years of leadership, the American Friends Service Committee's Wabanaki program has grown to become a vital hub of activities for the rights of all indigenous people as she works across vast geographic distances. Altvader and other Wabanaki adults who've been placed in Maine's foster care system as children helped train more than 500 Maine Department of Health of Human Services workers on complying with the 1978 federal law designed to reduce the high number of Native children being sent to live with non-Native families. She has provided anti-racism and cultural training for Washington County jail guards and university systems. Denise is currently a member of the Maine Indian Child Welfare Coalition and the Maine Indian State Tribal Commission, sorry, Tribal State Commission. Altvader also chairs the Wabanaki Criminal Justice Commission, which exposes and addresses issues of racism and abuse in the Maine State prisons, and in 2007 was appointed by Governor Baldacci to serve on the Maine State Prison Board of Visitors. And I guess you all j will speak, and then, so I'm, I'm not introducing you in the order you'll speak in, necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I'm only in the middle, because they can't sit next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> we don't always be <laughs> So Esther Etienne is a Passamaquoddy woman from Sipiak. No, I said that wrong. Sipiak, I knew I was going to say it wrong. And a mother of four. <laughs> She joined the Edwin, Edwin S. Muskie School of Public Service in 2004, engaging young people in foster care to ease the tra their transition to healthy adulthood. Esther has had a critical role as a Muskie staff person and a community member in the work around the Wabanaki State Truth and Reconciliation Project. Prior to joining Muskie, Esther worked as a family support specialist for Penobscot Nation Department of Human Services, providing preventative and early intervention services to Penobscot families. Esther has experience in community organi organizing and social activism. In 1992, she formed IRATE, Indigenous Resistance Against Tribal Extinction, a grassroots effort to stop the exploitation of Native spirituality. Esther is particularly knowledgeable about the Indian Child Welfare Act and was one of the principal designers and presenters of a curriculum for child welfare staff intended to foster best practices in compliance with the 1978 law. Esther served on the CARE Alliance, a national effort to end disproportionality and disparity among children of color in the child welfare system. 
Esther earned her master's degree in social work at the University of Maine in Orono in 1997 and has served as an adjunct faculty to the school facilitating the first year MSW field seminar. And lastly, and then we're going to actually, least. not least at all, at all. <laughs> Martha Poole um, is a district operations manager for the Office of Child and Family Services, Child Welfare Division. She supervises the program administrators in Maine's northern four of the agency's eight districts. She's responsible for oversight and management of the state's child welfare system, which includes child protective services, children's services, adoption, and foster care licensing. <laughs> she is also the tribal liaison working on issues related to the Indian Child Welfare Act. Martha formerly held positions as assistant deputy director and children's services and foster care licensing program specialist in Maine's child welfare system. She helped develop Maine Caring Families, which was one of the offices, which was the office's therapeutic foster care program, and served as the regional coordinator. She was a children's services caseworker working with children and adolescents in state custody toward the goal of family reunification or other permanent plans for the child. Prior to that, Martha was a supervisor at a residential treatment center in St. Louis, Missouri. Martha received her BA degree in sociology from Washington University in St. Louis and her master's degree in social work from the University of Maine, Orono. She is also the past president of the National Association of State Foster Care Managers and has been a member of the federal consulting team for the Child and Family Service Reviews and has participated in the review of child welfare systems in several states. Thank you all for being here. Seems like a lot when it's red like that. I know. <laughs> I was like, wow. And I get up every morning thinking, am I really an adult? <laughs> Um, well, I guess I get to I get to start, um, so, you know, so these two can behave a little, uh, have some time to relax. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, um, get people to think about the land and the territory you're on and, and the water. Um, <coughs> I, I, when Donna was talking about um, attempts at genocide, we're really not supposed to be here right now. Wabanaki people were targeted for destruction, um, and we were the subject of many policies of genocide. Uh, there were over 20 uh, tribes in the Wabanaki Confederacy, and now there are four remaining with five communities in the state. So wherever you go in this, in this territory, you see, you see water, with the, whether it's the ocean or whether it's a lake or a river. Um, just remember that there were people that, that depended on that water, and, and that was their lifeblood. Um, <coughs> I wanted to tell a little story. Uh, we have a dear friend, Rebecca, who's Beth's daughter and Donna's niece. Um, and we took kids on a kayaking trip uh, off the coast two summers ago. And the guide was talking about, you know, the beautiful Maine coast. And she said, and yeah, 90% of Maine's coastal property is privately owned. And she was just, you know, talking about how beautiful it was, and she was so proud of this territory. And Rebecca says, well, she said, did you know? And, and we, we had a, a group of Native children with us, so it was really important for her to share this with them. And Rebecca said, did you know that the property in the state was giving out to people based on how many Native people that they killed? So all when you think of this beautiful privately owned property and, and folks, you know, they bought this land and it's been in their family for generations. It came with a price, and a, a really big price. Um, so um, I'm grateful that we are still here in spite of it all. Uh, <coughs> and I wanna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'll give you a little bit of the history of the TRC project. Um, I'll start with that. Back, it, I mean, here it is 2011, and on May 24th at Penobscot Nation, the Declaration of Intent to create this process was signed by all of the tribal chiefs, um, Denise, who was representing the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission, and the governor of the state of Maine, Governor LePage. And it was a very historic moment because there hasn't been in the United States Territory a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process that deals with native child welfare issues. And to our knowledge, um, we work with folks from the International Center for Transitional Justice, and they work with folks all over the world. And 
to the best of their knowledge, there hasn't ever been a process where, for lack of a better term, people on both sides have collaborated together to make this happen. Um, usually, truth commissions are established um, and they have nation building as their goal after some kind of horrific um, act of genocide. So at, when Donna said this is different and unique, it really is. So here we were in 2011, May 24th. We had worked for three years just to get to that point of getting that declaration signed. Um, really the work and the relationship that we've built between the tribes and the state started, I would say, really got off the ground in, in November of 99. I was working for Penobscot Nation. Uh, we got a letter from the state saying, it, I think it was Administration for Children and Families, a federal mm -hmm. organization had came and given them a report card, for lack of a better term, and they had some issues with ICWA compliance, so they wanted to reach out to the tribal folks to help them. Um, so the first, <laughs> that we got, I remember getting, when we got the letter, we were like, oh yeah, <laughs> now they want our help. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, you know, we still, we persisted because everyone had as their goal, the best interests of Wabanaki children and families at heart. So we met to develop this training and, and we brought Denise in to help us with that. Um, the relationship was strained at the time. Even the tribal folks that were all in that room together, we had never talked to each other. There was never any network in our communication intertribally, let alone with the state. So there was a lot of relationship building that needed to happen. Um, we, we met for six or seven months and we developed this day-long training. Um, it was mentioned in Denise's bio. We trained over 500 workers in May of 2000 around the state. Um, and it was, I mean, it was great. We made a lot of strides in getting things accomplished together. Um, we had a more direct contact. This was before Martha was in that position, but the woman that was there before, um, Sandy Hodge, we had a more direct link to her if there were problems with uh, child welfare. If there were Native children in state child welfare custody and there were problems, there was more communication. And we formed the main Wabanaki Indian Child Welfare Coalition, which was just the tribal folks together and we got increased funding opportunities, we had a unified voice, things were seeming to go well. Um, the tribal child welfare workers would often report that they, that there was still something, that they were coming up against this invisible wall is how they would say it. There was still something unsettling and, and no matter how good things seemed to be, something would, they would always butt up against something. They couldn't put their, wrap their minds around it. So in May of 2008, just how, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how things happen. Dan Despard, who um, works with Martha, and uh, Marty Zangi, who works with me at the Muskie School, happened to be together at a conference somewhere else, a Jim Casey conference, and they heard about this idea of truth and reconciliation. And they said, maybe this would be something that, you know, the IPO work group and the main tribes would be interested in with the state. So uh, Jill Williams from the Andrus Family Fund, who has funded this project for us so far, came to speak to us. And Jill is an amazing person. She actually was the director of the Greensboro Truth Commission in Greensboro, North Carolina. It was the first truth commission in the United States. In Greensboro, North Carolina in 1979, five Labor Party workers were murdered by the Klan. And 30 years later, um, some folks, grassroots task force, wanted to have a truth commission around that. And Jill was the person that, that was the director of that. So, talk about having the most expert help we could ever get. Um, Jill came to speak to us and it was the tribe, all the tribal folks and we had people from state OCFS but we also had people from um, Attorney, General's. Attorney General's office. And we talked about this idea and the state folks were more than gracious. They, they, they too recognized that there was something, you know, we need to do more work, we need to take this further. They said when, you know, when you want us to join, let us know because everybody recognized the need for us, the tribal folks, to do something on their own. Um, so like I said, it took us about two years just to, just to have discussions and, and a, lot of, a lot of heartfelt discussions and a lot of tears about what we're reconciling around. What is the it? You know, the truth about what? Reconcile about what? Um, and we started having discussions about racism and oppression. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and this declaration of intent is basically just the document that they're, they're declaring that they intend to create this process and it officially starts a process. We started to draft that in the fall of 
2009, just the, the tribal folks before OCFS came on. It was six pages long. And we were, it was really validated. We were saying, put, put this in there, you know, what they did to us. Put, put the, the wars in there. Put the, blank, the smallpox blankets. Put, you know, and May, no, February 2010, yeah. we told OCFS, okay, we're ready for you. And so <laughs> they came, they come to this meeting and there's a six Even page, six page book. this six page document. And a lot of times what happens, I mean, racism takes many forms. But one of, the, one of the ways racism manifests itself is Indians get placated. You know, okay, we'll just, you know, we don't want to make them mad, whatever they want. And these folks didn't do that. They were like, we're not signing this and crossing this out and crossing that out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really a critical moment because it could have just been business as usual, but it wasn't. They, they, were, they were so invested in this process and bringing their whole selves into it um, that we, we decided, you know, we benefited from the process of creating that document more than actually what it said. So we decided to start over and we created it together. And it's much it, shorter. It was a page and then after the <laughs> after the attorneys got a hold of it, it's a page and a half. Right. But <laughs> but it was really something that we that we all could could own and we could all um, buy into and be proud of. And through that pro I mean it wasn't that easy <laughs> because those uh, um, those discussions we were having about racism and repression, we started to have with, with the folks from OCFS, with white folks, and we started talking about white privilege. And we started talking, I mean, I remember the first time when we said the word white, you know, it was a big deal. Cause you know, that, that's the one thing about being white, you don't ever have to think about being white, right? I mean, native people, we, we think about being native all the time. Um, so it was very, um, it was I, it, it was just a great experience. It was it was a humane experience to really take what we knew up here and what we knew to be the right thing to do and move it from here to here and really treat each other with um, with genuine compassion and love. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and it the our group now it we're called the TRC convening group. We're the organizing body behind this work. Um, we are really a tight group. And Denise and I traveled to Greensboro, North Carolina to learn from the folks there that had done that TRC. And the one, the biggest piece of advice he said is your group has to be, you have to be strong together. You have to always stay as one. Um, and to that end, I mean, there's, there's transparency. We don't have little side conversations. We don't have meetings outside of our meetings. Um, everything is clear and transparent. And no matter how difficult it is to say things, we say them to each other, and we say them, you know, with the best intentions uh, of what we're doing. So I, I mean, I like to think of that that work that we do is we're, we're undoing all of this colonization, we're undoing all of this racism, because Native folks, we have a lot. When we had that first meeting, and we said, "Wow, you know, if we do a TRC, there's not going to be any more us and them." And for Native people, I mean, for for white folks, that's given up some of their power. For Indian folks, we have to give up that victim role, which, you know, we, we sometimes get into, we get some benefit out of that sometimes. Like I said, being placated sometimes um, gets, we benefit it from that way. So, um, you know, the, the white folks around the table, you know, they've inherited this, this legacy of oppression. They didn't do this to us, but their ancestors did. They inherit that, they, they do have some responsibility. They have to look at how they benefit from the fact that we were targeted for destruction. And um, it's been difficult. So the TRC basically has three, we, we got three purposes. The first purpose is to create a common understanding of what happened and what is happening to Wabanaki children since 1978, since the ICWA passed until now within state child welfare, what's happened to them. And we'll, you know, we're going to hear stories of trauma, but we're also going to hear stories of survival and strength because people have navigated themselves through that system and they have come out you know, on the other side um, better for it. The second purpose is to the, the commission that we seat will make recommendations about how to improve practice and service delivery, how the state can improve their system to, to deliver better services to Wabanaki children and families. And the third purpose, um, and I think we all might put a little bit of priority um, on these, these different purposes, but the third is for healing, as Donna mentioned, for Wabanaki people. 
um, to give Wabanaki people a voice to start that process of healing. And to that end, we are um, really paying close attention. That when we did the training in 2000, we developed a video, and Denise was in that video. We interviewed Wabanaki people who were in state child welfare custody prior to the ICWA. And we, we heard their stories, you know, we, they were so gracious to just tell their story about what happened. And we made our little video for our training, and we didn't even think about what that did to them. Folk, there were folks that were started drinking after having years of sobriety. There were people that were institutionalized because it, we didn't pay any attention to that, and that was, that was a huge mistake on our part. Um, we're not letting that happen this time. Um, you know, healing is, is one of our main purposes, and we've, we're establishing groups, community groups, in each of our tribal communities of people who are there to educate the community about the process, who are there to um, help recruit people to speak, and that when the truth-telling aspect happens, um, they will be there to know what people need to be supported. And it, it's scary. People, we had a retreat of community group members a year ago, and people were scared. They're like, we're going to open a can of worms. Because, you know, silence is kind of the norm, right? In, I, I don't know about your community, but in our communities, it is. if you don't talk about it, then, then it doesn't exist. Um, silence isn't working. Um, our, our communities are suffering. Our people are really suffering. So, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to try to create that network of support for people. Um, Denise will talk a little bit more about that healing aspect. I don't even, I don't want to, see, I could like talk so long. I know you could. <laughs> <laughs> and we only get 20 minutes. Okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> you can go next or yeah. you want her to go next? Yeah. Um, I, I came to this process, like Esther said, um, because people in my community knew I had been in the foster care system. And they also knew me very well, and I'm, always, I'm the type of person, if you ask me to do something, I don't know how to say no, even if I don't know what I'm getting into. So I, sure, I'll show up, I'll do whatever. And so I wasn't prepared for the room. I, I thought it was gonna be a little video camera with one person, and they had umbrellas and lights, and that's <laughs> like, I would have like brushed my hair and you know, whatever, <laughs> and <laughs> <your> eyebrows. <laughs> fixed my eyebrows. Uh, um, and so I just started telling my story and it was the first time in my adult life that I thought about what happened to me. And I'm 52 years old and that was in 2000. And I'm telling this story and it's just coming out and I'd never, I didn't even know I had a story. Um, so they developed the video and we did the trainings and they, we did a lot of trainings and every, at every training we played the video, we answered questions and at, at the end of every training I would have a difficult time. Um, the, last day, the last training that we did I had made arrangements to go inpatient in a facility um, because I, I just I didn't know what was happening to me. I had never talked about this part of my life before. And uh, I decided to stay with the group and keep working all those years. I remember when Martha came, and I like to share the story because I think that it really shows what can happen on a larger level if people will be real with each other and just care about each other. Um, when, when Martha came, I did not like her. <laughs> she had no taste in people then. I, I, I'm like, jeez, oh, you know. <laughs> and so I, I would always say racism and look at her <laughs> to, see, to see what her reaction was. I used to, I used to do that all the time. And, and so one day we decided to have like this real personal discussion and we broke into groups and we talked about ourselves and I happened to be in Martha's group. And just having Martha look me in the eye and talk to me about who she was and what her experiences were, it all changed. It just all changed. And I think it changed for both of us. I don't think she liked me either, to tell you the truth. I was just scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you like her not? Yeah. Um, and, and after that, the whole dynamic changed. Because when Martha would counter things that I would say, I heard her for the first time. And, you know, we went on and on, and like Esther said, we came to this point where we really knew something else needed to happen. So when I, 
I look back at my experience, and you can you can pretty much take what happened to me and look at it for many people, Native people across the country, to what happened. Um, you know, I have six sisters. We were very young. We were very isolated on the reservation, and we were, you know, they came and took us. They threw our clothes in garbage bags and took us away in a station wagon. I had never been in a car before in my life. I didn't know what it, where I was going. They just kept driving, 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 driving. Um, and so there was so much trauma just in the taken. If, you, if nothing else happened, that trauma was just, I felt like, uh, to me, I didn't know anything but the reservation, and I thought my world was gone, and I didn't know where it went. Um, my mother disappeared, my oldest sister disappeared, and nobody ever said anything. So when we got into the foster home, um, for me, it was a torturous experience for four years of what they did to us. And it's a miracle that we actually survived those four years in that place. Um, these people had some really, um, they were really, I don't know how they thought up some of the things that they did to us, but they did. And I learned through the TRC process that my grandfather had been in Carlisle School in F Philadelphia, and I didn't know that. And it kind of makes sense when I heard what happened when he raised my mother. I, I kind of understood a little bit more about why my mother did what my mother did. And so I started having children, and I couldn't parent my children. Um, I had nothing to give them. I had no love. I have no. I had nothing. That there was nothing in me to to give to my kids. And then they started having my grandchildren. So when you look down the generations from my grandfather to my grandchildren, you can see the historical trauma has just just moved right along because nobody ever talked about it. My two sisters, my oldest sisters, are gone. Um, about two years ago, one of my sisters committed suicide. And you know, when I listened to her, her talk about um, what I had written in the Ford Foundation about the, um, the seven fires and the taking of the children, I had completely forgotten about that. And now I'm looking back at it, and I'm, I think to myself, some of that might have been changed, maybe not, but at least there might have been a possibility that other people like my sisters and what happened to them wouldn't have happened. And what we always say to each other, no matter what we do, how we do it, and how painful it is, the only goal in the end is that this never ever happens again to another child. Not while we sit in positions where we can stop it. It's just not gonna happen. And that's a common goal that we and all the other convening group members have. Whatever we have to do to make that happen, we will do. Um, People need to have a place to have a voice like I did. I was given a place, and it was a safe place, to have a voice. Granted, what happened to me wasn't pleasant. It was actually very difficult, but it was life-changing. And I, I started to think recently, I thought, I'm so afraid that we open these, this door and Native people who tell their stories are gonna start, you know, drinking and committing suicide. They're already doing it. Our people are already dying, are, are already hurting, are already in so much pain. And that if we're really careful, and part of my role right now in the TRC, I, I, I take a big role in the community groups, and we're gonna um, train people to do healing circles. And we've got people in our communities all the way from young men and women to parents and grandparents and people in the mental health field and other fields so that we can make sure when people come forward to tell their stories, what happened to me does not happen to them. Um, and I think that's, did I forget anything? 
Well, we could talk for hours. I know, I know. So if you didn't get it, I kind of talked about creating a common understanding. Dee Dee talked about healing, and Martha's going to talk about the third purpose. Which is systems change. Yeah, because she's um, the system. Yeah, I am the system. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the important pieces, especially that Denise was talking about with the Truth and Reconciliation, really is the historical trauma and the training of our staff and training our staff in a different way so they can really hear the why and the what's important behind some of the policies and the laws that we have. Because I think it's really um, difficult, or I can speak for myself, it's difficult for me as a Caucasian to hear that I'm racist when I don't think I'm racist, but I look at all the privilege I do have in life and I look at the different things that have happened and the advantages that I've had and how little I know, knew growing up of other cultures in Maine. So I think there really is uh, separation and segregation that you don't even really think about as you're growing up, even especially probably in Maine, which is the whitest state in the country right now. Um, but framing it for staff in the historical trauma prospect, I think, is really going to be a lot easier for people to hear <coughs> because people really need to follow the Indian Child Welfare Act and not just the letter of the law, but really the spirit of the law and why it was created and the importance of keeping children within their families and their culture and their community. And um, I think you can hear historical trauma better than you can hear racism. Um, so we really need to look at how we present things to our staff and really make sure that they're following the policies that we are setting in place. And I think a lot of them will come out of the TRC process. And that doesn't mean that we don't talk about racism, but we also need to talk about it in a way where people are at and when people can hear it. Because as we've all said, really the most important thing is the children and the families and however they hear it um, and understand it is the way that we really want to present it to them. And I think that we as the state have made a lot of progress, especially since 1999 when we all started partnering together. But we still have a long way to go. You know, last year there was a human rights violation that was found against one of our staff members in regard to um, the Indian Child Welfare Act. So we still do have um, a long way to go. We really need to work with staff um, on understanding that it's a government to government relationship. I think a lot of our staff are used to working with natural supports with families and with other service providers. And when it's an Indian Child Welfare Act case, they really look at the tribe really as a service provider as opposed to a government that has as much or if not more rights to, to the children involved in these cases than we as the state do. So it's really an education process. And it's an education process, um, you know, when Denise was talking about historical trauma and when we as, or our staff go in as caseworkers to a native family, you're not just going in and dealing with that issue, you're dealing with all the history and the trauma that has come down through the family and what's happened in the past generations. And they have, um, you know, they're very scared to deal with the system and very rightfully so. And so I think we need um, better education of our staff to really understand this and to work with families in a different way so that people don't feel threatened and hopefully that was one of the major outcomes of the healing with truth and reconciliation is people can work past the issues and you know start at the page where everybody's at. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think that you know we have a long way to go in looking at what we've done as a system as well. You know before the Indian Child Welfare Act, which people have said was in 1978, there really was a process in this country and laws in this country that really mandated the removal of a lot of native children and placing children in boarding schools. And you have people um, you know, that are still alive today that worked in the system in, in the 70s, yeah. in the 80s, when this was just starting to happen. And people were doing the work with what they felt was the best intention. So not only are you looking at the historical trauma on the, the part of many of the native families, you're also looking at a real defense mechanism on many um, social workers that were doing what they thought was right and was accepted at the time. So it really is a reframing of everything that's happened. And um, really, we've talked a lot about um, changing the dominant narrative, which was a term that I'd never been familiar with until we started this process. And that's what it's really about. It, 
you know, what will hopefully come out of the truth and reconciliation process when people tell their stories is the realization of what really happened as opposed to um, how we like to frame the way things happen because that makes us more comfortable with what happened historically um, in Maine and in this country in regard to Native American communities. Um, so I think that's gonna be huge. You know, it's what, 2011 and we're just developing the first standalone Indian child welfare policy. Yeah. You know, we've had policies um, in regard to Native families like throughout all of our other um, state policies, but there's, we've never as the Office of Child and Family Services, child welfare had a standalone policy um, that really talks about co-case management and not making any decisions without um, the tribe's child welfare system being involved as well as the state's child welfare system really investigating things together making joint decisions um, because that's what really needs to happen in regard to um, children and families to really get buy-in from families and to make the change necessary so that kids can be safe with their own um, parents or at least with family members you know i think it's something we've done a lot at as a system in the past decade, just recognizing that children are better placed with safe family members than they are in stranger foster care. Um, and I think that's um, something we should have learned from the Native community um, generations ago because you know, that's what tribes did. They took care of everybody's children if people couldn't do it and it just wasn't the framework that we were raised in. And I think that um, part of this process has also really been understanding what we can learn from each other and not just um, what we need to do together to move forward. Um, and I think we learned a lot about the language that we use and that the w about the way that we <coughs> talk to each other. I mean, I used to like love to say racist and look at Martha, you know, because it was the way I said it and meant it and she knew it. Um, and then, of course, everything, you know, at one point when we really became to, um, accept and care about and, I, and love each other. It really did take loving each other um, and feeling safe with each other. I remember when um, the TRC had to do a presentation in front of Mitzik and I sit on the Mitzik board and Martha was behind me and Martha's talking to this board and she talks about her white privilege and I'm, I, I almost <laughs> fell off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Is that Martha? <laughs> so, I mean, Great change is possible. We we need to we need to know how to do it so that it really can happen across the board. People, can, my mother-in-law always tells me, Denise, if people can't hear you, you're just going to talk. You need people need to be able to hear you. So, you know, I try to remember that in how I say things and and I think that um, for our management staff, one of the things that really hit home for us when we've been working on the Indian Child Welfare Act. We had a couple of summits in uh, the early two, mid 2000s, 2000s. yeah, um, and they were attended by our child welfare administrative folks, the tribal child welfare folks, um, federal representatives, representatives from the attorney general's <laughs> office, representatives from the judiciary, and we had a panel of youth. And in Maine, although there are four tribes. Only two tribes can actually take their own children into custody because only the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot Nation have their own tribal court system. So those are the only two tribes that can bring their own children into tribal custody as opposed to having co to come into state custody if there um, is child abuse and neglect in a family. And we had a panel of, of kids, of native kids that talked to us. And one child, um, both, both these children were from the Penobscot Nation. One had been brought into custody through the Penobscot Nation and was placed with family members. One had been brought into state custody and was placed in a non-native foster home and bounced a lot from foster home to foster home to foster home. And listening to these two young adults talk, um, the young adult that had been brought into tribal custody and been raised by family members had no clue really. She said when she was growing up that she was in foster care. She just lived with her grandmother. That was accepted in the culture. A lot of people did it and she had no idea that she was different. The person that had been raised in state custody absolutely knew he was different. He had bounced from foster home to foster home um, and was currently homeless at the time of this event. And that I think that really brought home for a lot of us just 
you know, how important family is and how important connections are. And if you can't be connected to a family, you needed to be connected to your community because this, this person just felt like he had no roots, had nowhere to go, and it was really sad. When Martha talks about challenging this dominant narrative, we, we talk about that a lot, and, and we've decided that the two major themes of this narrative are, number one, that Indian people can't take care of their children, and number two, we can't work together. And that, I think that was the, one yeah. of the biggest challenges, is to get over this notion that we can't work together um, you know, as Native people and, and white people to, to achieve this. Uh, when we were in Greensboro, we were part of this um, discussion and folks were saying, well, you know, well, that's all well and good, but how do you change the system? How do you change the institution? And Denise and I were, were like, well, what are systems and institutions? People. They're people. And, and what, we, what we're doing, anybody can do. I mean, we, you have, we have our minds and we have our hearts and we have our voices and that's really all we need. It's, it's a real humane process. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, we're all like happy now, but, <laughs> but we weren't happy the whole time. <laughs> but I think the system and more importantly, the children and families are really going to benefit from the way this process has worked. Because as Esther was saying, um, most truth and reconciliations really um, are the oppressed group that gets together, has the truth commissions, people come and tell their stories, and then the findings are really presented to the oppressing group. And it doesn't mean that there's buy-in from the oppressive group. A lot of times, people were just fine with how things were going. They didn't want to make the changes. They didn't want to admit the problems. And other than it just feels really good to be the first group that's actually doing it together, um, I think it's going to be much more beneficial because you've already got the buy-in from the systems being the tribe's child welfare systems for the four tribes and the state's child welfare systems. So people are already bought in to whatever the findings are, whatever people are saying, and whatever the commission makes for recommendations in really making this happen and moving forward. So, you know, the uncomfortableness and the awkwardness when we started this process is really saving a lot of time because I think other people and other commissions have probably had to deal with that after the process is done and they felt really good about what they've done and then things might not change the way we did it, I think change will happen because we're already at the table. Mm -hmm. and, and early in the process, we, we said we're just going to keep this at the agency level, the child welfare agency for the state and the tribes, but we started thinking bigger and we said we're going to bring this, you know, the government to government. I mean, we were going to do it regardless yeah. if they all signed on and, and, you know, it took us a while to engage the state um, before LePage's, the administration before LePage, we tried really hard and we really didn't get anywhere. Um, and Governor LePage, he, he, he just got it and he totally committed. Um, he loves Dee Dee. <laughs> 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 but she had one meeting with him and he's like, I totally, I, I get this and this is important. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> I did not do anything, I promise. <laughs> You had a picture taken with him. <laughs> but I think it's, it is really important to have the governor and the it governors is. and the chiefs sign on to this because, you know, when we do a lot of this work at the child welfare level, there's no guarantee <laughs> that it will, could carry over to another administration or that it's actually going to get followed by the commissioners or, you know, not that anybody would not want this to move forward. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that when it starts from the bottom up and the top down, when it gets to the middle, it usually works better. So, yeah, I know. A, anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, I do. I'm okay. <laughs> How old was the child welfare act? That's a good. Nine, 1978. What initiated it? Um, there were real disproportionate. Well, in the 50s and 60s, the Child Welfare League of America and the Bureau of Indian Affairs had this project called the Indian Adoption Project, and it was an experiment to take Native children out of their homes and be raised by non-Natives, and that experiment lasted 10 years. And after that, it was, it was followed by another project where hundreds and hundreds of more Native children were taken. And um, the man that evaluated this experiment had, had made a report. And he said, you know, this is, it's not working. Tribes, children need to stay with their, their tribes. And they were, you know, the boarding school movements. There was just such disproportionate rates. And um, Indian activists at the time in the 70s, um, you know, was really high Indian activism. And, um, you know, I, it was just a, 
a concerted effort for a lot of folks, and they brought it to Congress, and Congress passed that law. Um, and like Martha said, you know, there's this law, and it's a federal law, and you have to follow it. But that doesn't mean it gets followed, right. especially if it's not internalized and people don't see the value in it. So. But it's a big thing. Yes. How do you address uh, white privilege within the social workers that you are, are retraining or working with now? Well, we're actually in the process of um, updating our, our training to incorporate a lot of the work that we're doing. And I think um, white privilege is a term that's heard more and more, that's taught more in social work schools, so it's not as foreign a concept as it was when I started casework in the mid 80s. I had no clue. Um, but I think it's really about talking about the individual stories and bringing that home to people before you can just talk about white privilege because I think that's um, a different concept for people to get and to really internalize. And I, I think that, um, you know, if you look anywhere in this country, no matter what nationality you are, there there is a white privilege. There's, there's very much a European white male privilege. Um, and I think it's just explaining the history of it and that it doesn't mean that you as a person are racist. What it means is it's a society that was based on people coming over, of white men ruling, of white <coughs> men totally being in control, and really explaining it from that process as opposed to personalizing it for people. I think it's, it's a broader concept that you have to get. And I think we need to put it in simple terms that people can mm -hmm. understand and hear. And like, my granddaughter is going to be 16 years old next month, and I remember the day she was born, and I remember being at the hospital, and my granddaughter was born with blonde hair and blue eyes and light skin, and I looked at her and I thought, thank God. That was my, f I didn't say, what a beautiful child. I said, thank God, because I wanted her to pass. I did not want her to go through what I went through. And that's pretty sad. find people, when you tell your story, Denise, do you find some people are resistant to believing it and understanding it? No. Good. I, I have never, I have never encountered that. And, um, you know, I share a lot more about my story than what I've shared here today. And um, it's a pretty unbelievable story. It is, when, when, you, when I talk about all the little details. Mm -hmm. And I think that because it's so unbelievable, people can't even imagine that I would make it up. Um, my sisters don't talk about it. And I regret that I never talked to my two older sisters before they died, because my sisters and I have never talked to each other. We, I have six sisters. We never have talked. I have never talked to my mother. Um, so I'm, I was always, I've been in isolation until I, I started talking around these wonderful women. You know, it's almost like I found a place where I had a voice where I would be heard and I would believe, be believed and I knew it was safe. And that's what we're hoping to duplicate for other people in our communities is that safe place. This is a place where your voice is gonna be heard. You can, you can speak out and nobody's gonna tell you that you're lying and nobody's gonna tell you that it's not true. And I don't think that abuse in a foster home is a hard concept for state case workers to understand. I mean, I think they really understand that abuse um, occurs everywhere. You know, it occurs in very rich families, in very poor families, in middle class families, in institutions, unfortunately, occasionally in foster homes. I mean, I don't think that in itself is, is a hard concept for. And the, and the real, what we really want to get workers to understand is the trauma is just in the taken. Yes. Even if you were in a home that was the best home, yeah. there's still that trauma in that taken, and then that's still that feeling that you just do not belong. You don't, it, you know, it's part of who you are, and you and you just don't know. And and to imagine what that's like as as a child to all of a sudden be in a different place with strangers. I mean, I went to summer camp and hated being away, and that was like a choice thing that your parents did, and it was an okay place. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can't even imagine what it, what it would be like, or you know, <laughs> as people think about it, to just all of a sudden one day be here and all of a sudden be in another family. It's it doesn't make sense. And I, and I think the the thinking back then was, you know, if if whenever you remove children 
try to get them to forget about where they came from and they'll have right. an easier time. I, right. I think that Don't was the thinking. Don't let them visit their family till right. they've settled into the new place. Yeah, because then they'll, it'll disrupt their placement. And, and so you can't that place with practice. family because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree concept, which yeah. is totally mm. wrong and, and not done anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, about 30% of our kids in foster care now are placed with relatives. And when I started as a caseworker, it was probably like 7%. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I have a question. I'm interested in how, I think everybody can hear me. I was, I, well, we got to record it, though. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Technology. Um, I'm interested in how, with the policy development, that you had uh, discussions around what decisions are made and how they're made for a child being in an inappropriate environment. I ask this because I know that with cultural life ways and the way I grew up, many times when I was not on the reservation, but I was in my town community, the uh, non-Indian townspeople looked at my family as if we were being raised in an awful way. And uh, when you have issues of laws around truancy, for example, I was taken out of school for days at a time to be with my grandfather mm -hmm. on the river because that was the other aspect of my education. Mm -hmm. But yet I go back to school with my little note and the school might view that as truancy. Do you see? And yeah. so with the yeah. cultural differences, my mother had to fight to allow my uh, elder brother to have long hair. Um, so it, I didn't wear shoes unless I had to because I hated them <laughs> and I was always outside in the natural environment. And yet I couldn't go into my little white friend's homes because they said I was wild and didn't know how to behave. So what you have is I know, you know, sometimes neighbors are participating in so-called tipping off social services or they have a certain perspective on how a child is being raised and sometimes that's simply culturally based. It doesn't mean the child is at risk in any way. It's simply alien to the right. person the who's norm. viewing it, you know. Um, we actually do a lot of training with our staff on cultural issues, um, and that's one of the advantages. Um, if there are differences native in, within the native culture, you know, if we're going out and investigating jointly and doing the assessment together, then those pieces are picked up. Um, it's like with the Somali culture, we reach out to the Somali elders. Um, but, you know, the bottom line, child abuse and neglect things are really the things we're looking for, you know, the sexual abuse, the physical abuse the things that even if there's a cultural difference, some things just aren't gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. um, like some of the, um, like in the Somali culture, um, in the countries folks came from when they had like the um, female genital mutilation um, type of things. I mean, there are just some things in this culture that aren't gonna be okay that the laws look upon as abuse, but we really try to separate out true abuse from from differences. and. Um, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Agencies, um, their social service department, really have the same bottom lines in regard to abuse and neglect that the state has. There, um, a lot of the child welfare codes and our state law really are the same. So there isn't really a difference in the bottom line kind of thing. And in the first, we were in the first foster home for four years, and then they put us in a foster home that was, I mean, we were well fed, well clothed, nobody hurt us or abused us or sexually assaulted us. They were really nice people. But we were told not to talk about being native. We were told don't tell people you're Indian. They'll, you, the, you'll make them think you think you're better than them. I don't know what that was all about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't look like everybody else. I, I could not pass. And you know, and, and we forget because one of the things, like, the reason I say that the trauma is in the taken from your community and in your family is that we think that if we provide a roof and clothing and food that we have provided a safe place for children. Well, you know, if you don't feel like you belong, if you don't feel like you're accepted, then those are huge safety issues for children that we just don't pay attention to, and we do now. That we're, that is right at the top of our heads now, and it never used to be. I mean, just yeah. the fact that staff know to call if they have questions. 
is a huge improvement than when I was a caseworker in the 80s. And that they know that there's equity. And we don't ignore, <laughs> yeah, we don't ignore that anymore. They, if, if, you know, that's paid attention to, just as, you know, not being fed and, you know, all the it's, other things is paid attention to. It's one of the first to. questions that is asked when the intake calls come in, if there's any known Native heritage. It's asked on all our initial assessments if we don't know it up front. It's asked, um, it's one of the first checkoffs in court orders. It's, it's there. I was told to say I was Italian. <laughs> and I'm, I'm part Italian, but it was okay to say I was Italian. But. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Unless there's a student who'd like to ask a question. Um, thank you for this very moving and interesting presentation today. You mentioned the healing process as an important goal of this commission. And I'm curious about the forms that healing might take. And you know, my mind goes right to kind of traditional therapy, but I'm wondering about the wider variety of healing, and in particular, if there are processes or ideas that come from the Native tradition that help in this healing process. Yeah, we, we have developed community groups um, that we meet together, and right now happening on Indian Island, and it's gonna happen for the next three days, we have um, spiritual uh, peace and healing circle training going on for a wide variety of people. Um, for me, the, the, the whole picture of this, this healing is going to be more about how do we become a closer community? How do we talk about what happened as a community? Because we haven't even been able to talk about it ourselves or within our families. So if we start to talk about this in our communities and people start to move out of that zone of just being like walking dead people in certain ways, there's going to be changes. For me, I can, I can love and hug my grandchildren and feel it in my heart. I could never do that before. And it has been a difficult journey, but what I tell people when they become afraid of this process is I will do this a bazillion times over and take all of that pain over again just to be able to hug my grandchild and show them that I love them. And it gets better and better all the time and it's only gonna get stronger. It's not easy. It is, it, it's very difficult, it's very painful. But the rewards just are, you just can't measure the rewards against what what you have to go through. And we're gonna go through it, and we're gonna help people think, go through it. And I think the important thing in going through it too is we've talked about you know, supporting people in what they need, not in what we think they need. Yes. So whether it's professional therapy, whether it's a healing circles, or whether they wanna talk to their Uncle Joe and somebody calls Uncle Joe to make sure he's doing okay hearing everything that they're saying, it's really about what the person wants and not what and there's we a lot of there's walk. a lot of healing for people. When I heard what my mother went through as a child, I was just able to lose a lot of my anger, resentment, and hate, mm -hmm. and be able to look at my mother and have a little bit of understanding. I hope my children will be able to do the same thing with me. Um, we when we had our first retreat last October of community group members, we taught them a very I think a very important tool. We taught them mm -hmm. uh, the basics of reevaluation counseling, mm -hmm. which is basically two people giving each other equal time and listening. And it's, to me, um, it's, it's been a lifesaver for me. And it's it's also something that I think, I mean, I know that our ancestors, I mean, I, that's what people did. They listened to each other and they talked to each other. And it's, so it doesn't really, it doesn't pathologize anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need a psychologist, you know, that, oh God, somebody's having a hard time. They're crying, oh my God. You know, all they need is somebody to listen the to them. Give them a pill and you. make yeah. them feel better. Exactly. <laughs> So we've, we've brought that, we've brought the transition, William Bridges Transitions Framework Training to our community group members, which has been very useful for the convening group to understand and to, to get through this process together. And then we have this Peace and Healing Circles, which is uh, modeled after the work of Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. Um, and two of her trainers are in Old Town right now doing that training. That we're supposed to, to be at. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little scheduling conflict. <laughs> So we're, we're getting as many resources to the communities as we can um, 
and it's, it's, we've hired, uh, contracted with two Wabanaki women who are doing community organizing for us in those communities. Um, so, any other questions? 